This episode of the podcast is sponsored anonymously. Le'ila Nishmas, Menasha, Ben Reb Aryeh, Leibush Halevi, Tehei Nishmasa, Yitzhuro, Vizhar Chaim. If anyone would like to sponsor an episode of the podcast, which is $360, uh, please email me, farmchat.gmail.com, or in the show's notes, there's information um, via Zell, Chase QuickPay, farmchat.gmail.com, or there's a PayPal link if, uh, as well. Also, if anyone would like to support the podcast, uh, any amount, even a smaller amount, I appreciate it. Thank you to those that have. Please, um, you can use the same information. Um, also, if you could please subscribe to the podcast and rate and review on Apple Podcast, and um, you can subscribe Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, twenty four six, and anywhere else. Uh, just one uh, small comment on this episode. Um, this is about uh, Rabbi Sukhanpanta and his Dark Gemara, Dark Talmud. Um, so it kind of loose, of course, relates to the Spanish series. It's a uh, Spanish gobble and kind of around where we're situated in the Spanish series a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, but it's telling me that we go around around this time. Uh, but again, this is not being released part of the series. It's a separate thing. And this really, we delved into the safer as opposed to historical context. And we didn't really discuss historical background. Um, Rav Sackton is he put out the um, the new edition through Feldheim. Very nice edition. So we really discussed the safer and went into the edition. So hopefully uh, this is um, interesting and enlightening for those that aren't familiar with it. And if you are familiar, hopefully you learn something new. And uh, there'll be a link in the show's notes where you can purchase the safer. So thank you and uh, enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Svarim Chatter Podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Rav David Sakton, who is a Ram in Diaspora Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. And we'll be discussing uh, his new edition of the Sefer Darke HaGemara, or Darke HaTalmud, of Rabbi Sakhan Pantoin, the, uh, one of the big G'daylim, the late uh, Tkuva Sarishaynim of Spain. And this is, he was a uh, Rebbe of many, many, many uh, G'daylim, you know, late Rishaynim, the early Akhrainim, that, that Tkuva. Um, he lived, I believe, his years about 1360 to 1463. It seems like that's what it says on the Hebrew Wikipedia. It seems like he lived a very long life. And um, this is his Sefer that he explains, um, very classical Sefer, very important Sefer, explaining the Darke HaGemara, and we'll be discussing that. So thank you, Rav Sakton, for joining me. Very happy to be with you, Nachi. So let's start off. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. All right. Uh, well, I, I came to Jerusalem. I grew up in Texas, actually. And I came to Jerusalem when I was a bocher in 1970 and uh, became a Talmud of Rabbi Mordechai Goldstein Zatzal, in Diaspora Yeshiva. And I, I stayed by him, learned by him for uh, over 40 years but until he was Niftar. I'm, I'm still a Ram in the Yeshiva there. And uh, so all my my, my uh, interest in a method of learning came from him, and of course all my my uh, my learning of Eon Bakius. I, I I give a shir in Eon and I give a shir in Bakius uh, to students, and uh, and uh, I, I basically attribute everything I have to to my Rosh Hashiva. And he picked up on these books from from his rebbeim. It doesn't start start with him. And uh, and so I'm continuing that uh, Masaira. So it's interesting you say you give a share in Ian and Bakias, and we'll talk about Darke Agamara. How does Darke Agamara work in Ian and Bakias? The Rebusa Kampanta in Mahalach. We can talk about that a little bit also because it's interesting. But but well, let's. Yeah. So how did so as you say you so you your interest in Darke Agamara also should mention you've done other svarim on the Ramchal. Uh, Derek Tfunas and others of the Ramchal, and also in the Mahal Halima. So th- this interest, and then the idea to publish a new uh, edition based on manuscript with commentary, this comes from Rav Goldstein? Well, he simply told us, you got to learn this book. And he taught himself, he taught the book in the yeshiva, and uh, the, the uh, different uh, Editions we had were not always they're not as thorough as the one I printed in the end, and I didn't I didn't print this book until the year after my Rosh was Niftar, but but I I basically went through with my Harusa uh, decisions of 
how to go about it. And, uh, and that's how I ended up um, doing a lot of work thoroughly to go through the primary important manuscript of the book. And, and so my edition is basically the first publication of that particular manuscript, the exclusion of everything else. Like, like I mentioned, there's other editions, uh, scholarly editions drawn on many different manuscript sources. And, uh, and uh, when I decided I'm going to publish the book with a parish, I said, I have to have the best text of the book that I can without meddling in the thing myself. So I, I, I uh, got the copy of the manuscript from the um, National Library and permission to publish it. And that was the basis of this uh, book that I have now. Yeah, I think you're right in the introduction. It's a British Museum uh, manuscript. And actually, it predates the censor. The Sefer was actually printed in Italy uh, with the censor. That's why the, the name was changed to Darke Gamora. But in the manuscript, the, 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 the re- real name of the Sefer is Darke Talmud. But the Sefer is known as Darke Gamora, So you left it as it's known. Although the Sefer itself, as you say, is based on that manuscript. And there also is an appendix at the end of uh, Sefer Evan Arishin from Shmuel Al Valensi. Uh, Valencia, Talmud of Arisa Kampanta, and we can get to that at the end, Mr. Shem. So let's talk uh, just uh, right. briefly about Arisa Kampanta and himself and his biography as it pertains especially to the Sefer, uh, Dark Agamara. Well, I think that uh, we know that he was the, he had many Talmudim, and from his Talmudim came a lot of the uh, the early Afronim, including the Beis Yosef in Tzfat, they came from his Talmidim. So he was a, a very broad uh, person and uh, known to be uh, basically the Godel Ador of his time. So, so we don't have, but we don't have from him uh, anything uh, in the of uh, you know books of uh, on the Perushim on the Gemara or. We don't have any. This one little book is all we have. So, um, so uh, his his uh, contribution to future generations was this little sefer, which is uh, basically um, not very many books like it. I think the Ramchal is very similar, and he's generations later, but uh, but similar in the sense that they both took upon themselves. Can I put in writing in a simple form how the Gemara is built? I'm not talking historically. I'm talking about from the point of view of the um, the continuation of the Masorah and how we learn Gemara today. Well, where did all that come from? And it, it, we kind of were falling into the soup in the middle. We don't know where we are. So the Darky Gemara is is going to tell us from Aleph base where we are when we're learning Gemara. Yeah, the Shlach Kaddish does as well. I think he's coming from Darke Gemara, though, a fair bit, if I recall. But he does this also. Kaddish is actually one of the, one of the sources of the work because he quoted in the, in the section of uh, Limud Talmud almost two-thirds of the book. And uh, besides his Hastoma to the Gemara is one of the great uh, sources about the, what does it mean to learn Gemara. Uh, the Chazon Ish, more recently, was a very big cluster with his book. And, and uh, the, uh, it, during his lifetime, it was not in print. And he is the one who, uh, the, the fairly recent edition of uh, Miller from Ben Brock and Petak Tikva, that uh, uh, people who were close to the Chazunish were responsible for that. And he was the one who told them, get this book printed for me. So the, the, uh, in some of those editions, I have uh, like a, some, some uh, quotes from the letters of the Chazunish that he put at the back of the book as like notes about Derach Limud that come from the Chazunish. And and uh, so I added that also in my edition. It came from the Petak Tikva edition of the Take Gemara. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Sefer. Uh, you've mentioned already the Sefer is talking about, but let's talk a little more generally, and then we'll go through a little bit of, we'll, we'll go through, we'll try to, the Sefer a little bit. And as you said, it's a small Sefer, it's very small. 
your edition has a commentary, there's an introduction and commentary and index, etc. But it's, in reality, it's a very small safer. It's not a big book. Yeah, so what, what is the safer trying to do? What was Revisa Karpantain trying to do? What is the, the purpose of the safer? Well, on that one, I'm going to quote my Rosh Hashiva Rabbi Mordechai Goldstein Zatal. I think he had a, just a beautiful take on it that, that um, imagine uh, when we have the mitzvah of Esla, Sosla, Hashem, Haifir, Torah, Sech, and the Chazal wrote down the Torah Shabbat Peh. And uh, so the task is, uh, first of all, to contain the information of the Torah Shabbat Peh, which is uh, almost without end. How do you contain it in a in a in a uh, containable size of uh, written material? I mean, okay, so our our masift and things like that are about three times as big as the regular shas, but but uh, to, to write down the Torah Shabbat Peh is a very daunting task. So so the 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 main ingredient, according to uh, my Rosh Hashiva, is not only the content of the Torah Shabbat Peh, but uh, a, embedded in it is an instruction manual, how to go about it. In other words, the Torah Shabbat Peh would not have built in uh, a system of how it's going to be continued. So you have to think about Yerida Sadoros and, and all the different people learning Gemara and uh, and how are you going to make it that it doesn't just dry up? You want it to be able to continue forever. And now that was done on purpose. It's a, quite an amazing task. Uh, so the, the, the buzzword from my Rosh Hashiva Zatzal is the Gemara itself has to teach us how to learn the Gemara. If the Gemara didn't tell us how to do it, how do we know how to do it? So... Uh, that's the secret of the of the continuation over all the generations of our of our holy uh, Talmud. Um, another thought I can add about that is a conversation I had with my publisher, uh, of Yaakov Feldheim. May he live and be well. But uh, I was sitting in his office. He said to me, "Well, if you have a book to print, and you come to me, so I want to know who do you write that book for." So if you tell me. Well, I wrote this book for everybody. I think it's a great book. Uh, well, but I want to know more practically, who's going to read your book? He said, no, this, this book is for everybody, young and old. And it's going to go. So he said, if anybody said that to me, I would throw them out of my office. But, but when we think about the Chazal, they, they wrote a, a Sefer Kodesh Torah in such a way that that um, it can be learned in every generation with understanding, with excitement. Imagine the very same book is being learned by by the Rashba, by the Goin of Vilna, and they find it to be very deep and very interesting. And and then uh, turn the clock of generations forward a little bit, and you have. Uh, you have some, uh, you know, children of our generation, part, beginning fourth grade, they open up Elam Matthias, and here they are learning the Gemara. And they also find it interesting. They also find it exciting. Now, how could you write a book which is exciting and interesting and understandable for a fourth grade student who's just starting Gemara and for the Bill Goyan? If you write it for a fourth grader, You'd think that the great rabbis would be bored out of their mind to learn such a book. And and if you write it for them, you'd think these fourth graders will never understand a word. So the the uh, the system of the Gemara is is absolutely uh, Baruch HaKodesh and and, uh, and totally beyond to imagine that such a thing is possible. So the purpose of the Dark Gemara is to distill from the Gemara itself, how can I find the secret that will help me to learn it, be excited about it, and understand it? And given that, that uh, of course, there's many levels and levels because the Torah has no end, but how do I understand it? So 
I'll give one example of what he did when I say the Gemara teaches us how to learn Gemara. A simple example from the from the I think from the opening chapter, he he builds most of his principles on a certain language which is found in the Talmud, and uh, so in the first chapter, one of the first ones he picked was a phrase, "Hakabeshuftani uh, askinan," which translates basically. Are we dealing with uh, simple and foolish people? Come on, we're dealing with intelligent, great people. So what does he make of this statement? Uh, the Gemara doesn't say this phrase very often. I think if you, if you put it on a search, you'll find out it's uh, two or three or four places in all of Shas. But he picked out that phrase and built on it a principle that, that our Chazal, the, the great rabbis in the Gemara are, are highly intelligent and, and everything they say is quite deep and requires a lot of, of thought in order to grasp what's going on. So he pulled that out of the phrase, look, we're not dealing with simple, plain people, idiots or don't know too much. We're dealing with with the great people who are quite deep and, 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 and deep in their thinking. So when we realize that that's who we're dealing with, then it changes our whole approach to the Gemara. So, um, so he goes step after step, pulling out these gems from the Gemara in order to explain to us, this is going to open for you a opening of how to go about it. And then he takes all these things and organizes them for us um, in uh, basically in the seven drachim. So essentially... Seven ways, of, seven ways of going into learning, which I'll discuss later with you whenever you'd like. Yes, exactly. Essentially, it's an instruction manual on how, this, how do you learn. You pick up a Gemara, you pick up a Masechta, how do you read this Gemara? How do you read the Masechta? This is the Darki Gemara. This is the instruction manual of how you should approach learning and, and learning. So let's start off in the beginning. Right. It starts off, important to point out, as we were talking before we started recording, and you mentioned this, that the manuscript that you use, the Sefer, has simonim, has chapters, but in your Sefer, there are very nice um, names of chapters with subheaders that you created. There are no names in the actual uh, manuscript, but you created the the name. So the first one, the first simon, as you call it, Psicha Le Gemara, it's a Psicha, an introduction. So as you mentioned anything over there, so he has an introduction and then he goes into the seven drachim, <clears throat> the seven ways, the seven mahalchim in Gemara. So if, if, if you want to mention something from the Psicha, an introduction, <clears throat> before we get into the seven drachim. I'd be very happy to. First of all, I have to mention only the title of the chapters is, is mine. But those little uh, summaries at the beginning is actually in the manuscript. I, I saw from some scholar who said, oh, that's not Rabbi Yitzhak Confidential. Oh, that got added to where I really couldn't care less. But, uh, but those are in the manuscript and, and they're not my work. But the, but the title itself is only what I put myself. So let me, let me start with the, with the uh, Tichel le Gemara uh, Basically, the way I would define it uh, is there are certain uh, axiomatic principles of what Gomorrah is that if a person doesn't understand what Gomorrah is, then it, you're missing, you'll be missing something when you start with the practical instructions because you don't know what you're dealing with. So the, the Ptiha is basically to tell us what the Gomorrah is and um, I think one point I would pull out of the Pticha is, uh, is this idea that uh, the Gemara uh, is built on a system of a text written on top of another text. And actually, I, I wrote that this is, the, this is also stated in, besides in the by it's a confronton, the nature of a text and a parish on a text. It's also stated in the Paliya um, Talmud of uh, Rav Shmuel Nagid in the back of Rochos. He says that from the very beginning of Torah Shabbat Peh, 
that is in the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu teaching us the Torah Shabbal Peh after he received it from Har Sinai and was kind enough to give it over to Klal Yisrael. So um, the, the uh, Shmuel Nugget says, from the very beginning, it had this form of Mishnah and Gomorrah. That is a text and then an elaboration of another text on top of that, like a Mishnah and a Gomorrah. So the, the, the Mishnah, of course, before Rabbi Yudanasi, was Omar Kodesh Baruch Hu, Omar Moshe Rabbeinu. But the, the Gomorrah, so to speak, everything was Baal Peh, but the Gomorrah, so to speak, was all the elaboration of the stories and understanding of, of that uh, form of Mishnah. So the, so a basic, the basic entity of learning Gomorrah is, is a text on a text. And of course, as the generations go on, we keep adding to that pyramid because we have the Mishnah and the Gomorrah, then we have the Rishonim, then we have the Achronim. So the pyramid only gets bigger and bigger, but it's all a text on a text. That's, that's I think, one of the most important uh, characterizations of what Gamora is. Um, the other one, like I mentioned, is uh, from the language of Bishuktani Askinan is the is how great and how deep are the are the rabbis of the Gomorrah in their thinking and how much we have to appreciate both their deep thinking and their precise words. So uh, those are all like basic axioms before you even start. And then after that you get to okay if I have some idea what Gamora is, sounds very exciting. Let's go for it. I'll just say one more principle that's from the opening of the Ptiche is, I hate to mention this, but there's a, a word that nobody likes to hear. It's called hard work. And and unfortunately or fortunately, uh, that that's built into the system. The Gamora takes work. And, uh, and of course, you can make it easier by giving people signposts, by letting them know what we're about to do. But, but there's no substitute for, uh, for sitting down and with, uh, you know, and thinking about it and doing the work to understand it. And, and, the, and the, uh, the right side of that is that the work will definitely pay off as the Ghazal teaches him, you got to matasa tamin. So, so that's, I think that's enough for the Ptika. Now I'm ready for the practical side. Yeah, and then we then he goes right into the practical side. Derech alimud b'shiva drachim, which is you know I'll let you talk about this, but right away there's derech harishin. Every you know it explains every mimer. You have to see who's talking. Mi hamadaber, mi ameshiv, mi makshel, yashoyel. That's the first part. Then you see the the main issues. But I'll, I'll let you go on and explain you you know in brief mention what the seven are, and then obviously that's that's really the second chapter, and then continuing throughout the sefer, Rabbi Yitzchak continues elaborating on these seven. Drachim, the seven Mahalchim in a Gemara. Yes, that I that I've, I've uh, explained that the the uh, the book is very organized. You have a tikha that like the axioms. You have to know what you're talking about before you even start, and then you have the the uh, the core program of uh, seven drachim, seven ways. The he characterizes them in the beginning of chapter two. These are seven paths. Everybody that learns Gomorrah, without exception, the simplest student, the greatest ilui, nobody can avoid going through the same channels. Just some people do it quicker, some do it slower, but everybody has to go through these seven paths. Uh, everybody has to walk down these seven paths. So, so now. That's the statement of purpose of the book. Then the middle chapters up until 14, 3 to 14, are all elaboration on the seven uh, paths or, or seven ways of, of uh, practical learning. And then the concluding part of the book, chapter 14, is the an analysis of the actual uh buzzwords or the most common words that are your signposts when you learn the Gomorrah. Very valuable thing to know about. And 
like I say, on the on the idea that the Gemara teaches us how to learn Gemara, so it's it's no mistake about it that the Gemara has certain languages that you see over and over again, and they are our signposts. They're helping us how to get through the work ahead of us. So that's an overview of the of the book, and um, and now let me uh, let me go into the seven drachim, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the seven drachim, uh, the um, I printed them in the front cover of the book in an order which I think is uh, which is a, a little bit I stole from the Ramchal to do this. But it's also based on the the it's a confrontation uh, and how he set up the seven drachim in his uh, chapters of the book. But I would say the the beginning and end is is what I would call uh, the system of shach of Atariya, back and forth, may and bay of the Gemara. So one is uh, like you mentioned the, the opening of the of the um, of the of the uh, seven drachim is to know uh, what each statement does, and 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 then a little bit further in, he tells us the in the second derek what are the two sides of the whole debate going on. There's a shakavatariya, but the the when I rearrange the seven on the front cover of the book, it looks like this. There's a um, there's a uh, list of seven key things to do. So I put them in the order I think is practical. One is when you have a shakalvataria, you have to ask yourself, well, are there two basic sides of a question here? What are the, the uh, it might be a three, four kashas and a terrorist that get rejected, another terrorist instead of that one, but the different, the, the, the kashas on this way and that way and the the riots, it basically, it comes down to a a fundamental question with two sides. And there's a debate going on. Uh, and we start from a from an opening move and then go back and forth in this debate until we come to the conclusion of the sugit to know where we end up. Uh, so that's the the one of the seven drachim that I put first in the in the book, I think it's number two. The last one of the seven, is is uh, is simple is shachlatari on a simple level of what's the kasha, what's the teres, what's the raya, what's the stira, what's what are each what does each statement in the sugya actually do? What's the purpose? So um, uh, here the the Ramkal helps me out a little bit because you think that that should be the simplest one is just to know what each statement does. That's shachlatariya, but it's actually the two-sided understanding is is uh, is a little more basic, and the and the moves are are um, are a little more uh, they, they're simpler on the surface, but much more complex when you look into it because there's a progression of what comes first, what comes second, uh, first this kasha, then this terus, then then before I. I give another table, so I ask another kasha back on that, and then I come back over here. And back and forth, different statements with a purpose. So following the line of, of those uh, statements, one after the other, is uh, can can get uh, a little bit complicated. You have to keep track where you are constantly, and the more you the more you go further, the more you have to get your bearings where you are, otherwise you'll become lost in the sugya. So, so the the following step by step is is actually in some ways harder than defining the ab more abstractly the concepts the two sides of the debate those are two out of the seven drachim i say in chakravatari of one which is the two-sided debate and one is the actual purpose of every statement uh i think the next step in the seven is um is these three what's the Kiddush of the Hazal? What's the what's the uh, underlying swara of that statement or kiddish? And and when you have different opinions, so find me a chilek 
between the different ideas that makes a difference to explain why there should be such a Baklikas like that. Uh, I'm saying this very briefly, but basically the, the Kiddush of the Hazal and then the, the underlying reasons, which can be involve a lot of investigation in the Sugi before I get to them. Uh, and then the, then the nature of, of the Gomorrah having be built upon Mahloikas of different opinions. And then there's uh, a basic understanding that each opinion uh, recognizes and understands the other and said, why don't you agree with him? He has such, if he has such an intelligent and profound idea, uh, why do you have to be uh, Marvin Machlikas be soil? Why, why don't you just agree with your colleague and not and not have to disagree? Huh? You disagree for the sake of uh, having a good uh, debate. So uh, on that, I say there must be a, a chiluk. There must be an essential difference between the two views. And focusing in on that is a, is a very deep uh, level of doing the work in the sukkim. So if I put those three together, the the Hiddish, what's what's the what's the new idea being presented? What's behind it? What's the top? What's the reason for it? And and where is the difference between the different opinions that 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 drives the whole argument between them? Those three. Uh, uh, together with the first two of Shachavatari, I'm up to five. So I have only two left. Uh, the last two of the seven drachim uh, is uh, is two different systems of of making diukim. And uh, when I talk about diukim or inferences, it, it, diukim are a big mystery. A lot of times people don't really know where you're coming from when you when you're uh something in a in a Gomorrah text, it, it kind kind of feels like you're pulling a rabbit out of the hat. But um, in order to understand the uh, the inferences of the Gomorrah, so I think I'll I'll give this introduction. It's a little bit also from chapter one, and the Rampal elaborates on it even more. But there's a basic idea. Uh, if I go back to the thought that the the uh, the Chazal wants to put the Torah Shabbat into a concise written form uh, in, a, in an easy language, uh, in a system that can be learned by everybody of all levels in every generation. Well, uh, one of the first things you have to do is you just cannot say everything. You have to leave some things to be understood by the reader, by the listener, by the student. So that's the basis of the Ukim. They say what they say. They say it very carefully in order to imply that there's maybe other things going on here, which I didn't have to tell you. I didn't have to spell it out. I expect you're going to think about it and get there. So the last two um, drachim of the seven drachim is how do you make an inference? and uh, and I'll I'll just say briefly what they are. The um, I think uh, to use the language of the Gemara, you have the Machlikas of uh, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shmuel in the in the Mido Shator Nidreshes Behem. Is these are in, in the drushes of the are actually how to learn the Psukim with the extent extending. From the Psukim, how do I derive the laws of the Torah? So there's two systems, uh, basically. Rebbe Ishmael, in the Brisa that we say every morning, uh, is basically built upon Klal and Prat. That is to say, in every Pasuk I'm looking for, uh, where is a general concept and where there are detailed concepts. And when I go from from cloud to prat or cloud to prat to cloud, then I have room for inferences. When I say, well, I, I said this particular instance, but of course you know that I mean to include in the more parts of the general rule. This was just an instance of it, and I want to extend it beyond that to include more things in it. That's called uh, cloud and prat, a, a, an individual case and a more generalized case. There's many many details of how those inferences are built. 
Rabbi Akiva, on the other hand, uh, learns based upon primarily ribui and miut, uh, not klal and prat. And so klal probably had a general category of laws and a specific law, and Rabbi Akiva is, is uh, from one thing, I extend it and expand it to another realm or to the more laws related to the first one. That's called ribui or extension. And the other principle is to contract or memaye. In other words, when the Torah says something, am I supposed to understand the Kiddush is only here? This is it. And don't think it goes anywhere else. This is a big Kiddush only here. Sometimes they say the opposite. Sometimes they say, it says it here in order to tell you everywhere that this is the principle. Sometimes they expand. Sometimes they contract. So the, in the seven drachim, those two systems of where inferences come from, from general and specific laws, or from expanding and contracting on the given laws of the Torah, those are the last two of the seven drachim. So sum up, I have two in the field of Shaklavataria. I have three in the field of understanding what the great rabbis have told us uh, and uh, and their disagreements between them. And, and that's two and then three. And then the last two, inferences. So that's the seven drachim. And um, and then after he explained them in chapter two, of course, the the all the middle part of the book is details about that. And uh, it's uh, this was uh, this is the I've had people who tell me that they don't understand these connections, but I believe that that uh, that um, when he tells us these are the seven paths that everybody has to go down. Then he's not going to tell me. Well, there's actually another ten more, which I'll bring you. Uh, I'll <laughs> when I write the rest of the book, you'll see there's a lot, lot more things to do. So it really would be much more effective if everything else fits into these, because he said these are uh, inclusive of everything. Uh, so that's why I organized the book that way. Um, and uh, I don't think I'll go into detail on the middle chapters, but. But the uh, uh, brief overview of the seven drachim gives us an idea of what we're doing when we actually learn. We are following the May and Bay of the Gemara. We are delving into the depths of, of the uh, words of the Chazal. What is the new idea that they're proposing and where does it come from? What's the reason for it? And, and why would anybody disagree if it's such a great idea? And and finally, uh, it's impossible to communicate to us all the laws of the Torah Shabal Pen, the Halacha, in a way which uh, does not include uh, things which are implicitly understood but not explicitly stated, and. Um, I'll just say a story about the uh, Ketzos HaChoshen wrote a parish on the Shulchan Aruch that uh, in his introduction, he says this, that, uh, you know, it was a terrible thing to publish a Shulchan Aruch as you're going to give the final word on, on all the laws of the Torah. So I, the Ketzos, came along. I decided to throw in a monkey wrench. And I'm going to reopen the topics and show you that those simple laws in each little sif of the Shulchan Aruch are actually quite deep and have a lot of uh, of uh, implicit understanding to be expanded upon. So, uh, so it basically, uh, if you if you make the mistake of thinking that the Rambam or the Shulchan Aruch came to uh, put in the final word, and that's what the Torah is. Well, the um, the uh, Ketzos and the and the other great uh, Akronim and Rishonim come along to tell us, well, there's a lot more to it, because what they say has a lot of implicit meanings, which you can't understand the, the halachas without going deeply into those inferences. Okay, so that's seven drachim in a short form.
Yeah, very very short form. And it, it, even though it's a short safer, it's something you have to read and understand. And that's why you have your notes and commentary, which we can talk about. I just want to mention, I, I opened up a random chap- chapter. I want to re- say, mention a little bit. You said, well, we're not going to really discuss the middle chapters. And we'll be here for hours going through the safer. But I will well, just mention. How about the game? But he does mention, he does go through, there are examples, either generalized examples where he explains the Gemara does X and Y, and the Gemara brings such a shyness, and this is what it means. Sometimes he even goes further. I'll just open the random one, I'll read a little bit, none of you can follow. I'm just picking this on the fly, we didn't print this before, but Simon Vav, he says, what you write, So he says, when you see in the Gemara, two Tanayim Amarayim arguing with each other. So... There's two reasons. One is a siba, which is why they're arguing. And the second thing, he calls it pre or nafkusa itachlis. Right? There's the outcome, ladina. What's the actual practical difference? And then he continues that you have to know to find what's the siba. How many, why are each one not wanting to say like the other one? And then he brings an example. I think that's why I want to point out. He, says, he brings examples. He brings a marshal from the like, Gemara Babakam. Everybody knows, everybody probably ever knows our Babas Nazik. And one of them is Mavas. The Gemara says, my Mave. Rav Amar Mav is Adam. Mav is Adam. Dichsev, and he brings a pasuk. Shmuel vechulu. Shmuel Amar Mav is Hashem. Dichsev vechulu. Rav. And then the Gemara continues. Rav, my time will never get Shmuel. But Shmuel, my time will never get Rav. Bal Zed never betam. And then Rabbi Zeh Kampanta continues. But my kumiflugi, which is saying, Mahi Asibam Nilam Lachlik. Why are they arguing? Masvari Yesh Lachal Echad Mehem. And then, then, then he continues. Vasiba lepamam Yesvara a pasuk. Sometimes one is a svara, one is a pasuk. That each one he has a reason or a pasuk specific to him that he holds of, and that's why. I didn't, or he has a yeah. But so long, my receipt was my cousin. And then he continues. I just, I'm just bringing this to point out so you can see a little bit of the example. He, he goes in depth and he walks you through. This is what it would mean. This is what you have to know. Here's an example. And he, you know, he walks through continuously. On, I, don't, I don't know if you have anything to comment on that one. You don't need to, or if you want to comment on any other ones, but that's somewhat of an example of a middle chapter. And there, there's more there that I just wanted to bring out I'd, a little I'd bit. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. Uh, First of all, where does this belong in the in the seven drachim? The, the, uh, uh, very exciting chapter, as you mentioned, because uh, you know Machlok is in the Gemara, is the name of the game. Everybody's always talking about, uh, you know, Abayah says this and Rabbi says that and Shmuel says this and Rabbi says that and you know it's it's uh, but the uh, dark Gemara uh, puts this into the uh, framework of the seven drachim. I have to know what's the real difference between those two opinions. I can't just say, well, he makes sense. The other guy, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me, you know. I think that's a pretty stupid idea. But we know that everything they say is quite deep. Now, if it is, and and it's they they have a reason and a force for what they're saying. So in the end, how could they disagree? How could they disagree? How come there could be like such a difference of opinion like that? So the the uh, this chapter is really uh, helping us like get between all those dilemmas of of wait a minute uh, if he said this how come he said that how do you get through all those moves and end up with a clear understanding of a uh, of a machlokes in the chazal and this is all part of the uh, the uh, fourth derech of the seven drachim of find a chilek that makes a difference. Find me the pivotal point between the two great rabbis. So I'll give a simpler example than Rav and Shmuel. In the very beginning of Gittin, it's something I think everybody learned. Uh, Rav says, I'll tell you why you got to stay at Bifone when you bring a, a get in, because over there they don't know about Lishmo so much. So that's why you got to say before I nechta, before I nechta in the beginning of the Mishnah, and and Rava says, "No, come on, uh, that has nothing to do with it. The reason is because when you travel so far, you're never going to get Aiden to Mekayim the Star, and you're going to be in big trouble uh, if you don't Mekayim the Star. Who knows what will happen after that? The poor lady, uh, someone could question if she's able to really be married. So, um, so I have a machlekes of Rabba and Rava. The Gemara explicitly does each one of these steps of the Dark Gemara uh, in over there at the beginning of Gittin. They first ask, my time. What's the there, there has to be a reason. You have a you have a, a Mishnah that says 
say the magic words. This get was written and signed in my presence. Well, why? What's the reason? So if I don't have a reason to explain the difference of opinion, so then I don't have a difference of opinion. On the other hand, if I have a reason of why one rabbi says this, why the other rabbi says that, uh, the the uh, I say, listen, I, I could talk about that till I'm blue, but it's philosophy, it's philosophy. Tell me a practical difference. I need to know how, how what comes out of that. So the Gemara right away in the beginning it says, "My benayu, my benayu." What's enough kamina? And and uh, when you get to uh, Rav and Rav in in Daf Gimel, just one page later, then we say uh, we don't have the words that's quoted in here. Rabba, my time, Alomaka Rabba, but we have the same idea because each one is going to bring the Hechrach for his position. So uh, so those are the three parts the reason for Amachlekas, the, the practical difference, and the and the uh, and the and the proof that each one has of, of why I don't say like the other one. And between those three, I kind of digest them together. I'll come up with the pivotal point of the Matlekes called the Chiluk between the views of the Chachamim. It's a it's a it's a system that works, and uh, and I'll just mention one more thing about uh, because the the um, the two basic ideas is is there's a Chiddush and the Akra, and when you say a a, a Torah law and uh, I say, well, I know that already. I, you're not telling me anything I don't know. So you say, well, well, this, no, this is something new that uh, it's necessary for me to teach it to you. So I say, new, uh, new. You say it's a new idea. Well, Hamash Osam in Torah. We don't have new ideas. What's this? So, so you have to tell me where you got it from. What's your hechra? Where's the source? And then you tell me the source, and then. I'm going to jump back on you and say, well, uh, if that's how you know it, then anybody could figure it out. So it's not a new idea anymore. So now I'm caught in a dilemma. Uh, is it new and exciting, something not learned from any place else? Or is it something, and then it has no source, I say, I, then I don't need it. I, I need to know what the Torah teaches me. Or if I have a source, then I say, well, then tell me what's new about it. So when you get caught in that dilemma and find the golden path, through it, then you'll come up to the to the true core of what's being said, or the pivotal point, the chiluk of the of a machlekes in the chazal. So that's basically where this is a expanding on the uh, one on those three uh, middle part of the seven drachim of how to understand the new ideas of the rabbis, how to understand why they could possibly argue. And and to understand what's the reason for their arguments and what's the force, what what makes them say what they say. Now afterwards, so again, there's there's much more you can go through the you know everyone should go through the safer and uh, the the fourteenth um, chapter is Dark Elishen is Talmudis. So Rabbi as again using your header where he goes through various. The shyness, which is im isna im isa less naha, my shire, the high shire, um, famous, you know, chasur mechsura, hachi ketani, hachi kamar. He explains the difference between hachi nami mistabro or deka nami, dektani. Um, you have the aklal, asuye mai, eludvarim, minyona limute mai, what's the coming to be mai, you know, and on and on, ketzad or lam or lamad over doima, lafikach or hilkach. He tries to mention a lot of the times there are differences. The Gemara uses a different word, it's not the same, lafikach or hilkach. Um, talk about you can talk about some of that. These are yeah. kind of overarching, uh, more language type things. Yes. Well, what's it doing here? Uh, I basically finished with the seven drachim at this point in the book, and uh, so I think I'm, so to speak, going back to basics. That that if the Gemara is going to have embedded in it the secret instruction manual 
though, though the place where that really is is in these key words of of uh, that the Gemara uses over and over again. Each one uh, is used to to uh, tell us like a principle of how to think in the way that the Hazal is really instructing us and teaching us when you're dealing with a halakhic problem, uh, how are you supposed to think about it? So the instructions how to think come from all these details. So the, the main thing I added to them, uh, and I, I did not change the order, but I looked at the order of these long list of terms and tried to group them into categories of, well, this group of, of words, it's doing a certain function. So I wanted to generalize and, and explain, uh, here's a certain function that's being done. And then there's a few variations of how to go about it. And, and uh, I'll just add one more thing about the key words of the Gemara is, um, is uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Confidon wrote at the end of chapter eight that, that um, just like the words of our great rabbis, you have to think twice exactly what they mean. Uh, you can't just take it on face value without thinking into it if it makes sense to you and how to understand. And then he adds an interesting thing. He says, and the, the standard buzzwords language of the Talmud, you also have to think, what do they mean? In other words, don't take it for granted that these words, even if they occur over and over and over again, mean the same thing every place you see them. There might be a general meaning what they mean, but if there's an exception, don't be caught off guard because you don't have, they're not like just uh, computerized, uh, uh, you know, program words. They are, they're thinking words. So, so, uh, so he cautions us in chapter eight, before, long before he got to 14, don't get caught off guard if these words are used in an unusual manner. But, after I, I, when I opened chapter 14, so, so I, um, I uh, basically asked myself, well, this is a very long list. And is there any rhyme or reason? Is there anything systematic about it? And, uh, and I think the answer for Hashem is yes, there is. There's, he, he goes in order of, um, a certain approach, what do I need these words for? And I, I put these, uh, these categories basically into my margin notes next to the paragraph. So um, he opens chapter 14 with, uh, with everything connected to understanding the mission and the Bryce. That is to say, the, uh, in the Gomorrah, you have kind of it's not just Mishnah and Gomorrah, but you have also prices. So therefore you have mixed up a little bit the the Torah's Tanoyim and the Torah's Amoroyim. So there's certain languages which are there to help us organize our understanding of the Tanoyim in particular as a starting point. So uh, then that's the first group. Then then there's uh there's another group after that dealing with how did the Amoroyim position themselves in relation to the Tenoyim. Then by looking on through chapter 14 and my side notes to get these categories, uh, the, the, um, the next one is, uh, it looks like it's going into some detail, of, but it's talking about Ribu and Miu, about inferences of when do I expand, when do I contract the understanding of the text. This is very important for both the, the Tanaim and the Amoroyim. So, so I, I have to do this uh, uh, as a group by itself. 
those languages, la suye mai, la fuke mai, minyana limute mai, le picas, those are all dealing with inferences. Uh, fourth group, uh, defining categories. When I'm summing up the 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 Amoroyim, so I need to know uh, where do I define their their halakha categories. And so there's another group of classic words of the Gemara that tell me what's in the box, what's out of the box. Afalpi. Well, it looks like it's out of the box, but it's really in the box. Uh, Lo me boy. I don't need to tell you this because it's obviously part of the same category. Uh, so that's that's another whole group by itself of of understanding the the halachic categories that are dealt with by the Amoroyim. And I could go on and on, but the um, the uh, the next group, which is the biggest ones, I'll end off with this and that go into more detail. But the 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 fifth group, which is basically half the chapter, is a word of the Gemara, which are the signposts in the Shachlavataria between the Amoroyim. Uh, and these have a, is a very long list. Uh, languages of Kasha, languages of Teres, uh, Haimai, Elo Haki Komar, Hagufa Kasha, Haki uh, Nami Mestavra, Shita. These are all uh, uh, signposts in Shachlavataria. And uh, it takes up half the chapter. And there's also, uh, I made some breakdown into, into uh, categories here too, which I won't uh, take your time to spell them all out. But, uh, but basically, I think as a conclusion to the book after the seven drachim, uh, and after looking into the, the deeper understanding of walking down these seven different paths in every different uh, part of the Gemara that I learn. So so then there's back to uh, the Gemara teaches us how to learn Gemara. And one of the main ways the Gemara teaches us how to think is by uh, using these uh, repeated uh, buzzwords. Yeah, and I think uh, the last chapter to explain is about Havamina Maskana, explain the importance of Maskana. And I think it's it's important to also mention the end of this, especially here on the Sfarim Chatter podcast, is how he ends the Sefer is very important to mention. And he says, Ein chokmas adam magas, ela ad mokim shesfarav magi, and a person only has chokmas till he has his svarim. Ulechein, therefore, yim kor adam kol mashi yesh leviyikna svarim. He should sell everything he has and buy svarim. Ki derech mash will give an example. Misha ain le sifre a Talmud. If someone doesn't have a Talmud, he have shalili as baki, but you can't be a baki gemara and have a gemara. You don't have medical books and other things. You can't know it. And he really ends off a real plug for Svarim. And remembering this is a time when he, he was really hey, writing. Chatter, that's a pretty good push, right? Yeah, no, no, <laughs> it was, he was writing at a time where he mainly had manuscripts and different things. And even in the beginning of print, Svarim were very expensive. But still, this is still as he's writing. You still, if you have Svarim, you know how to, you know things. If you don't have Svarim, you don't, know, you don't imagine, know. Imagine, imagine his time buying books and buying manuscripts. Yeah, fortunately. and there were professional sofrim to to write out copies of books, but uh, it wasn't simple to own books. And uh, of course, in our generation, there's so many books coming out of our ears, we don't know where to begin. But, but uh, I think the uh, the the LCD is basically even in our time when books are so available. Uh, I think the key idea is we have to value them. It doesn't help to pile up your shelves with books. You have to value the books. And if you do that, uh, you'll inevitably gain a lot of Chochmah. And uh, and it's almost impossible to get the Chochmah without them. 
Yeah. Now, also, but that, that's the end of really Dr. Gamora end. We didn't, there's much more to discuss. But then you added on a small, it's almost a chapter, even though it's like a own little work. Evan Harishin from Rashul Al Valencia is Talmud. So why'd you add that here? And just in brief, what is that about? Okay. The, the, um, the, um, this is written by a Talmud and uh, it's Torah from Yitzhak Kanfenton uh, and it is not exactly on the same uh, line of thinking of how does the Gomorrah teach us how to learn Gomorrah? This is a this is really a a more of a, um, a love discussion about the logic of Kalva Homer. And uh, and I'll mention uh Machlikis Rishonim uh basically between uh Yitta Kanfenton on the one hand and the Halichas Olam on the other hand. Uh, that that when the when the Gomorrah has a binyanav based on two different places. I make a binyanav. If I learn a certain law from from some place where it's beferish, I learn it to another place, and I say, oh, that can't be. There's a there's something not similar between those things. How can you learn one from the other? They say, well. I'll I'll learn the same thing from a different place. I say, well, yeah, I can't learn it from there because there's something not the same. So then, then I say, well, I'll I'll put the two together and make a uh, make a binyan mishnah stuvim. So the the uh, the uh, the problem with that is if the first one didn't do the job and the second one did not do the job, well, two zeros don't add up to one. How do you get it to work? And and the same thing is true about Kava Homer, where the Gemara has a Kava Homer, then a, and then a Kava Homer the other way, and a Pircha that way, and then they say the Hoser Adin. So the, uh, uh, the one of the explanations of Hoser Adin is that is that uh, the circle goes around and around and never stops, and therefore you you don't you you'll never end up with a a decisive Pircha to remove your 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 uh, deduction, uh, but Rabbi Yitzhak Kanfenton uh, doesn't learn that way. It goes around forever, and you never get out of it. Therefore, you never have a solid rejection. He learns Kozer Adin means that the after the Kava Homer and after another Kava Homer appear in the opposite way, and then you come back. He learns that the whole idea is to bring back the the uh, Original Kava Homer to its original strength, Kozra Din Lei Tano. It comes back to its full strength, and then you have a solid Libud. It's not just the other way, is kind of by default. You can't remove it because you're just going to keep on going around in circles forever. You're never going to be able to remove the Libud. Therefore, it has to be true. But if the Confidence Zone says, no, you can come to a solid proof uh, by saying the, the, Back and forth doesn't go on forever. It brings us back to a deeper understanding of the first Kalva Homer and everything in the end does then stands. This is a very lovdish uh, sugya of how Kalva Homer is built. And um, the one thing I would recommend in this little uh, work of, of uh, Rabalensi is, is uh, he gives a beautiful example of of a Kalva Homer uh, based on uh, uh, like a mashal, a story of different people. Uh, and it makes it very easy to grasp the, the thinking process because you're thinking about simple facts. So he has, he has three people named Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi. One of them is the uh, is blessed with sufficient parnosa. One of them uh, is a hard time with his job, but at least he has a roof over his head. The guy with a good job, he's paying rent. Uh, but so there's different mileage. The person has a roof over his head. There's another fellow named uh, Shimon who uh, who has parnosa, and and the third one uh, has siata uh, deshmaya. So now I, I start reasoning back and forth between them. Well, 
if 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 he has a rule for it, he has a rule for it, but he doesn't have uh, a, a, a good parnasa, but he has tiyata deshmaya. So it must be that he has a good parnasa as well. How could he not? He has tiyata deshmaya. So they say he learned from Gava Chomer. Say, no, 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 but the guy with tiyata deshmaya, he doesn't own a house. So therefore, he doesn't have a good parnasa. So he goes back and forth with this simple mashal, and he tells me that really every Kalva Chomer, I'm talking about a certain uh, subject matter. The subject matter I'll, I'll call the Ruben Shimon and Levi, and a certain Torah law that he's uh, hired to pay this money, or he's hired to bring this korban, or he's a uh, potter, or, or this is also this is mutter, different laws. So the laws are uh, Ruben has a law called owning a house. Shimon has a law called making a living. Levi has a law called having siyad de And somehow he pulls through. So to, to redefine the, the different, when they have all these debates of Torah laws, to define the subject and the law in simple terms, like this fellow and this is what Hashem gives him. That's a subject and a, and a law. So this allows me to analyze very deeply the whole process of reasoning by Kava Homer from one to the other. So that's really the, the topic is, uh, I'm just uh, explaining from the outside a little bit what's going on. It's a very deep topic. And um, and uh, to the book, I would say, Yadil Torah Yadir, that uh, here I have something outside of the dark Gomorrah that comes from Rabbi Yitzhak Kanfenton, and since I don't have anything else, I'm thrilled to have this. And um, and so since it since the uh, the writer of the manuscript that I based my book at, on, he was kind enough to include this uh, this text at the end of the manuscript. So I said it deserves to get published together with the book. So that's why you included it, and it's it's, it's, an, it's a little uh, it's a small little thing in the back. I also want to mention you also have uh, there's there's a listener to Talmud, so it's, you know small kind of index. You also have you also included Sas Darke Ion Lachazanish. You mentioned earlier the Chazanish's interest in Ion and in this, so that you you mentioned I think that's you have that's I think it's um, counting how many Zion, and then you have Maftechas. Now I want to mention something about your your commentary. So first of all, the Sefer, as you said, you used the manuscript, you made it fully Manukid. Include this in the text, but what you did interestingly was your commentary. So there's two different types. Um, you have two types: Hagos, um, Hagos, Levi, and you have Tvunot, Tvunos. Now, there's, so there's two. It's like two columns. I'll let you explain what the difference is between the two. Why do that? I do also another thing about the notes is they're not on the bottom of each page. So each chapter is the chapter, and then the there is a there are letters or numbers uh, corresponding to the commentary. One commentary is with numbers. One is with ICS. Um but it's not on the bottom of the page. I don't know if you got that. Yeah, I don't know. The, this is like the the say for Rav Cheshmaitza and Chef Shmaitza. I have a reason for that. That's where Baruch Ver Leibowitz has come from Chaim Shmuel Lapian, Rabbi Lapian Sunder, Rosh Hashanah Sunderland in England. He told him you shouldn't write written your commentary in the bottom of the. Why are you writing it at the bottom of the sefer? So is that why you moved it to the end? Is that the, you didn't put it on the bottom of the page? I'll tell you why I did it. Uh, it's basically uh, based on one of the ideas in the Dark and Gomorrah that the essential structure of the Torah Shabbat Peh is a text on a text. So. One of the things he says there in the first chapter is don't read the Gemara and right away read the Rashi with the Gemara. Rashi is not a pair of crutches to help you read the Gemara. Rashi is a parish on the Gemara. So read the Gemara by itself. Try to understand it. After you understand the Gemara by itself, then read Rashi. What will happen? you are guaranteed to jump up and down with a tremendous new insight. Guaranteed. How are you guaranteed to have a Kiddush? This is all a quote from the first parrot. Uh, he says, well, there's only two possibilities. Either you'll read Rashi and you'll find out that Rashi says more or less how you understood. Then I say, okay, but if, if I understood that without Rashi, then why'd Rashi have to say it? 
So when you delve into the Rashi a second time, you'll find a tremendous chiddush in in what Rashi had to say. That it's not just a a uh, uh, like a cliff notes to explain the Gemara. I could read the Gemara. I got it without Rashi. So Rashi must be telling me something much deeper. And what if Rashi doesn't agree with you? You're also guaranteed to get a chiddush because then you have to ask yourself, well. How I understood the Gemara, that was it's a logical possibility. But Rashi must have had a good reason why he rejected it. So let me think about that. And I'll come up with a Kiddish in understanding Rashi. So it's a win-win situation. So that's what I that's what I mean when I say the the Torah Shabal Peh, in its essence, is a text on a text. So I found if I I thought about this, if I wrote my parish on the bottom. It might take up too much of the page, and uh, and then it'll, you won't read the Dark and Gomorrah so easily. Whereas if I have all the chapter uh, in order without a parish, then it encourages people to read the book before you read the parish. And then I I didn't want to put the parish like a separate book at the back of the whole book, because then I would be afraid no one's going to get there. <laughs> so, so I decided to to compromise. Each chapter, then a parish. That way, I, I think in the system of how to learn the book, I can advise people, read Rabbi Yitzchak. You don't need me. If you understand him, or you understand him differently, or you like to go a little deeper in how you understand what he said, then uh, Loni is to try out what I had to offer and see if you gain from that. So that's how I organized it with the chapter and then the parish. I can also answer the other question a little bit. Why did I divide the parish into two parts? Because in the book itself, I find that that uh, that Rabbi Yitzhak Kasbenton is doing two basic things. He's telling me principle, and then he's giving me Gomorrah examples. Um, by the way, in my parish on the Ramchal, I did the same thing. I, I have... Uh, I go sleep be on the principles of what the what the author is telling me, and then I have tefunos to the understanding of the examples, and each example really gets a, a fuller understanding of the principle. Of course, comes from examples. So, so I I break it up like that. That when reading the book, I look for just tell me the principle he's saying before he gives an example of it. What is the principle? And maybe that needs some elaboration to to explain more clearly what is the underlying principle that he's outlining for us. That's that's the parish of Agosli B. And then when you get to a Gomorrah example, then I ask myself, why is that Gomorrah an example of that principle? And and needs to be divide the parish into two parts. So, um, uh, for, first of all, I will link the safer in the show's notes. Also, let me ask you, um, the other, your svarim of Ram, so this is uh, Feld, published by Feldheim, as you said. Your other svarim that you published on the Ramchal, are those still available? Uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, I have a, a, a English translation of the Ramchal, which is available. It's English facing page Hebrew with a lot of ex- Explanation in English, uh, that one is available. I have a Hebrew parish of Agosli Bitfunot, which is actually out of print, and I would I I didn't uh, just run it through again because I it was it's more than twenty years old, and I'm in the middle of uh, working through the parish again. Uh, so that that's really my current writing project is to uh, is to renew the Parish of Hagosli beats Funota Amchal, and uh, but in the meantime, what's available in the stores is the the uh, the ha, It's called Derech Hakodesh, the three books of the Ramchal, uh, Derech Funo, Sefer Haigayon, and Sefer Melitza. Uh, in English, I call them uh, Ways of Reason, Book of Logic, the Book of Words. So those are available in in uh, English in a large uh, single volume in English from Feldheim, and the Hebrew Ramchal is available with uh, some introduction and side notes, but without the whole commentary, which I'm trying to redo. Uh, so.
So the Ramchal, I hope to make it more available than it is today. Now, so I'll link that Derech HaKadosh as well. Let me ask you this to close. You mentioned earlier when you met with Feldheim, they asked you who's the, who's the safer for, who's going to read it. So, of course, it's somewhat for every, everyone, everyone learns Gemara, but who is it for? Let me ask you here. And who do you intend yeah. your, your edition for? And who do you think you should learn uh, the, the safer Dark Gemara? Well, I think uh, any Dark uh, Gemara students on any level, uh, can get some benefit from the book. And uh, basically, I would say uh, high school and college level uh, is a little more thorough that they can benefit from everything there. But my experience in, in teaching a method of learning is, um, especially in the Ramkal, in the English Ramkal, I divided it into uh, units of study that I find that if I'm dealing with the grade school Gamora beginners, uh, I can take one or two of those units and spend a whole long time with them on that, and they'll gain tremendously. I wouldn't try to throw the whole book at them because it's too much. But uh, I think my basic audience is anybody that that uh, wants to improve their their level of Gomorrah learning, they have what to gain. And uh, and uh, so I would just caution uh, beginners that uh, don't don't expect to get the whole Torah on one foot. Find something that you relate to and work on that part. Then later on come back to it work on a different part. But if somebody's an experienced Gamora learner, then I say, read it. And I'll tell you the difference between the book is for people with a more um, yeshivish background, Darky Gamora is definitely more accessible than the Ramchal. The Ramchal is in a certain way more philosophical, uh, and uh, but he's, he's extremely uh, thorough and deep in his analysis of the Gamora but the language is more difficult. So uh, one of the main uh, challenges I have in writing about it is how to make it more accessible. Um, but in short, I think that um, that uh, for for uh, yeshiva students, I would recommend Dark Gemara first and the Ramchal afterwards. And for uh, for uh, people that are not as familiar with Gemara. The the Ramchal actually is more more basic, but he's so ex, uh, complete in his system that uh, I would say uh, don't try to swallow it all in one bite. Uh, start with the with the parts of Der Tefunos before you get to the other books in the Ramchal. If if uh, for someone who's uh, not so experienced in learning, but uh, but basically, the whole reason why my Rosh Hashiva pushed us to learn this, and I've been dedicated it for, for very, very many years. My first publication of the Ramchal was in 1989. Uh, so it's been quite a few years. Uh, my main interest is if you want to be excited about learning, and that's really the name of the game, you have to know how it's done. And, uh, and these books are a tremendous key. And uh, of course, you have uh, modern modern authors, tons of uh, of good advice about how to go about learning. But the uh, the only drawback is, do they have a complete system, and do they have the authority uh, equal to the Ramchal and Rabbi Yitzhak Kanfenton? So uh, I think the, these these books are are winners on that score. And uh, it's it's work to get them, but each one is like a gold mine. It's every bit of work which is invested pays off. Okay, so thank you very much for joining me to discuss uh, Dark Gemara, Dark Talmud, and like I said, I'll link in the show's notes.
if anyone is interested in purchasing it. And also, uh, it should be available in farm stores, both. And the Ramchal Saver should be available in local farm stores for those interested. So thank you again. Yeah, they're all, they're felt out, they are available. The only one which is not is uh, from from 20 years ago. I have a Hagos Lippi on the Tufunot on the Ramchal, which is out of print. Okay. So thank you again, Rav Sachton, for joining me. They have, they have also uh, uh, a lot of tapes of uh, Shirim on the books. If you want, I'll, I'll send you a link to tapes that you could put that in there somewhere too. Perfect. Yes, please send the link. I'll add that to the show's notes as well. Um, so perfect. And as far as the books, it's look up look up the Ramchal and Yitta Kanton in, in Feldheim's catalog and you'll find it there. Okay, terrific. Okay. Thank you so much, Naki. I really appreciate it. I'm very happy to meet you. Likewise, thank you.